brothers and sisters in Christ. Being able to see uh, a little video of what it might have been like on that first resurrection day is amazing. But just imagine for hundreds of years, most Christians never had a chance to see from either a filmatic point of view, let alone really a lot of artwork. There wasn't a lot of things that people had to be able to see what it might have been like. But, you know, even since the beginning of the Christian faith, People have been trying to visualize and paint and make pictures of the empty tomb, of the resurrected Christ, of the angels and the women who came to the tomb and to see their surprise. And I came across one time a, a beautiful Easter card. It was an Easter card that uh, was made to look like a Christmas card. Because on the left side, on the top, there was a picture of the baby Jesus in the manger with the shepherds gathered around and then on the, on the other side, on the right, there was the same shepherds, but 30 years later, a little grayer, their beards a little longer, standing around an empty tomb. Very beautiful contrast. And we don't know if the shepherds ever had a chance to go from having seen Jesus' birth to being there at the resurrection, Perhaps that they had become disciples. Perhaps they had, they had followed Jesus. But we know that it is a beautiful contrast to look at Jesus' birth and Jesus' death. And Jesus' birth, it's the love of God that we see coming into the world. And then in the resurrection, we have the triumph of God's love that is the thing that gives us joy. And it is so exciting to know that God's love is so powerful. So... Which one is better? Which one is greater? The birth of Christ? The birth of God's love? Or the triumph of God's love? I would say that you can't really split the two. They're inseparable. Christmas and Easter go together. And be that's because God was reconciling the world in his son. He sent Jesus and Jesus had to become human in order to be like us, to take human sin away. And his mission from the beginning was to go to a cross. To die. Jesus knew this. But you can just imagine how patiently he waited. He didn't start ministering or preaching until he was 30 years old. He wanted to be able to get the best audience possible. To reach people's hearts. And the society at that time didn't think much of younger people acting like they knew everything. Now Jesus didn't have to act like he knew everything. He knew everything. But he did it with love and kindness, sometimes firmly when he had to deal with the Pharisees. But we see that the wonder of this text this morning from Luke's gospel, the amazing thing about the resurrection is something that maybe is lost on us sometimes. If you are familiar with the story, maybe you've heard the story of Easter every year. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. You know, I was born in a Christian family and always went to Sunday school and church. And then, you know, becoming a pastor, you can't really skip church. So I've always been in God's house. But whether you've been a Christian for a short time or for a long time, I think it's important for us today to think again about coming to the story of Christ's resurrection with fresh eyes. To hear the story once again with wonder and amazement. The way that it was meant to be understood. The way that the first witnesses of the resurrection experienced it. See, the problem is that our familiarity with the story and scripture can numb our senses. And then it doesn't seem so special. In fact, we might not realize the importance of how Luke is trying to bring us this eyewitness. He explored and interviewed as many people as possible. You look at the very first chapter of Luke and he said, I talked to everybody, I investigated. I wanted to make sure that the stuff I'm telling you is truth. And so he gives us these words very early in the morning. On the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb. That just sounds like they got up early, just like lots of us do. And yet there is that point that it was not just morning. They got up while it was still dark. Before the sun had come out, 
They had a mission, and that mission was a mission of love. And so the opening words of this are the intentions of their hearts to show honor to their loved Savior, the one who was they believed to be the Messiah. And it wasn't just that they were going anytime. They go early. As the sun was breaking forth, they may have imagined the words that came from the first book of the Bible. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. The creation of light is a thing of God. It is the light that physically lights our path. And so as Luke is telling us the story, he's not just showing us that all of a sudden the ladies could see that when they got to the tomb that the stone was rolled away because the light had come out. It was also making a point that this is how God opens our eyes. He gives us the light. He creates the light. And we're talking about the spiritual light in your heart to be able to see who Jesus is. And I have to admit that the title of my sermon, An Empty Tomb Proves Christianity, An Empty Church Denies It. The second part is obviously true. But the first part, I have to change it a little bit. Because it's not actually true that an empty tomb proves Christianity. If that were true, then lots of people would be Christians, especially at that time. But there they were, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the guards, and even the women. They saw the empty tomb. And when Peter, at the end of our text, sees the empty tomb, he walked away in wonder. So the, the empty tomb doesn't prove Christianity unless the good news is preached that Jesus is risen. Because Jesus is risen, as the angel said, that is the thing that makes the empty tomb full of meaning. And God blessed their hearts with that light of understanding. Now, I think that the other part is that they went to the tomb. The ladies, uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Joanna, as it says in our text, they didn't have a plan. I mean, there's no way they're going to get into a tomb that has a huge rock in front of it. It had been rolled in front by the Roman centurions, and they wouldn't have been able to move this on their own. But they didn't go thinking, okay, we're going to get a, you know, a crowbar, we're going to move it aside. They didn't have a plan of action. They just went ahead. They went in love. They didn't think about it. And God had gone ahead of them. God had already made a plan. And isn't that true for our lives? In so many ways, we go through life. We don't always have a plan about where things are going to go or what's going to happen. But God is watching out for us. That God rolls away stones of problems in our lives in so many ways. We don't even see them coming. We don't even think about them sometimes. But God is watching out for us. So we can see the way in which God was preparing for them to find that empty tomb, to hear the words of the angel. And that is the way in which God continues to prepare us because he'll roll away problems in your life so that you are ready to hear the words of the angel. The good news shared, he is not here, he is alive. Are we ready this morning then to look with wonder once again at the resurrection of Jesus? Are we ready to understand what is happening in order for God to shine his light in our hearts? So that we might grow closer to Jesus, that we might truly know that he's alive and not just think, oh, that would be a great thing if it were true. You see, in Jesus's resurrection, we see that God showed us how much he loved us. He showed us how much he cares for us. In fact, he is showing his miracles to us all the time. We need to look with wonder, not only at this story of the resurrection, but look with wonder at how God is working in our lives today. Back in the seventh century, there was a, a Christian uh, writer, his name was Gregory the Great, and he, uh, he wrote about one of the issues that he found in his day. And we're talking about in the 700s, and there was Christians who were taking for granted what God had done, and so he writes this beautiful thing about how God wants to reach us, and he gives us so many opportunities to see the miracles in our midst. And so he says, if a dead man is raised to life, all men spring up in astonishment. And yet every day, 
Someone who did not exist is being born. And no man wonders, though it is plain to all without doubt, that it is a greater thing for, to be created, someone who uh, didn't exist before, than for one to be restored who already existed. Another thing he adds on to that is how in the Bible, the, the feeding of the 5,000, how, how Jesus fed 5,000 plus people with just a few loaves of bread. And it sa he says, 5,000 people were filled with the five loaves, yet every day the grains of seed are sown and multiplied in fullness over the earth. And no man wonders how this happens. And to be amazed at the uh, wonder of the water turned to wine at the wedding of Cana in John's gospel. And he says, you know, the wonder of the water turned to wine is something that we marvel at. Yet every day the earth's moisture brings uh, uh, being drawn into the roots of the vines of the grapes that are turned into grapes and then turned into wine. And yet no man wonders. I think today maybe we, we suffer from this scientific idea like, oh, we can explain all these things. We know how plants work. We know how they can grow. And yet, can we create a plant in the laboratory, let alone a, an animal or a human being? We cannot create living things from non-living things. It doesn't happen. Despite what science tries to tell us, no living thing ever existed except that that came from something previously living. And so where did the very first living things come from? It has to have come from a designer, our creator, our loving God. So miracles of life, of fertility, of the earth providing for us, of the things that we see around us, these are all evidences of God. And they help us to see the miracles in our midst. I think that those are little ways that God is saying, yes, I'm here. I'm already doing wonders among you. Will you open your eyes? Will you see the wonder of my creation, of my love? Will you see my son in the world around you? Now, of course, you know, we're not going to simply recognize Jesus because we have, uh, you know, some uh, fruits and vegetables or bread, but instead God gives us even more than that. He doesn't want to just feed our bodies. He wants to feed our souls. And so I, I think that the women, as they were looking for Jesus, it helps us to see how they would find Jesus. It was determined by where they thought they would find him. Of course, they were looking for him in the, at the tomb. They thought they would find him dead, but instead God had different plans for them. God had the plan that they would find Christ on the road. He would meet them. Now, in John's gospel, we see the very first person who sees the risen Lord is, is Mary Magdalene. Now, why in the world do the women go tell that Jesus is alive and then Mary Magdalene is the first person to see it? Because you know, as we read today, that when they said Jesus is not in the tomb, that he is alive, did the disciples get excited and run and say, oh yeah, we believe it. It says, no, they, they thought that this was nonsense. You see, in the culture of the first century, uh, a woman's witness was not permissible in court. Now, obviously, that was a very prejudiced perspective. But we see God recognizing that he doesn't care about what humans think. He didn't follow the advertiser's methodology for getting a good story out. He simply goes to the people that would be least listened to in order to share the gospel message that Jesus was alive because if it's true, then it will be true no matter who says it. And if nobody believes it, it's still true. God proclaims his truth in a way that humans would never have done. If somebody else would have written the story, if this was made up, someone would have said, Oh, Jesus appeared to the high priest, somebody with authority. Jesus appeared to the Pharisees. Oh, they're the ones who were in charge, and they were against Jesus, but now they're for him. <clears throat> but he didn't do that, those things. Jesus wasn't interested in trying to convince people who hated him. He wasn't interested in 
coming to life as a magic trick. It was for the love that God had for the world. It was for the love of those who saw that he was dead. They, the women went to the tomb because they were looking for the one who had died, their leader, so they could anoint his body. It was out of their love and honor for him. But Jesus tells them that he's going to meet them. And the angels relay this. And how do they react? So they are now turned to joy. They're looking forward. Jesus said he's going to meet us on the road and in Galilee. Now, of course, he appears to them, to the disciples in the locked room, but he tells us in uh, the other passages of scripture that he also met them when they go to the Sea of Galilee. So he makes many appearances to his disciples, and it is in these appearances that Jesus is found in places where maybe they hadn't thought of, they hadn't looked before. I think that's a good lesson for you and for me. Where do we look for Jesus? Where do we expect to find him? I think that we actually do have some expectations, don't we? God, I've been praying to you for the blessing of healing for my mom, we might say, or for my spouse or for my child. And isn't God supposed to be there helping me, appearing and giving the blessing of healing to those that I love? Well, he can. But when we are looking for Jesus in the places where we determine him to be, where we expect him to be, then that may not be where he's to be found. He reveals himself more than any other place in his holy word, in his word of love, in his words that are spoken, not just written down as history lessons, but as love, a love letter to his people. You can look at any word of scripture and you can see God speaking to you. One of the best examples might be something like Psalm 23. And David, who lived a thousand years before the time of Jesus, was able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, he didn't necessarily think about the coming of the Messiah, that this shepherd would be Jesus himself. And yet, Jesus truly is our shepherd. He truly does feed us, strengthening our faith as he gives his body and his blood for us to eat and drink, as he continues to meet us in his word, as he proclaims his love for us in the forgiveness of our sins. We see God in action, especially when we face the valley of the shadow of death. You know, David could say, I fear no evil, not because he didn't fear death, but because he knew that death couldn't overcome him. God was stronger than death, and Jesus is the fulfillment of that. So we can find Jesus in the places where we walk through the valley of shadow of death. Maybe it is a difficult time. Maybe you're dealing with pain from the death of a loved one. Maybe you're dealing with issues of finances or problems in relationships. God will meet you there. He will show himself as the resurrected, powerful God, son of God, the one who loves you so much that he doesn't want to leave you in your pain. He'll walk you with you through it. So when we look for Jesus in the places that he promises, the forgiveness of sins, in the love of God and the love of others, we will truly find him. We'll have the eyes of faith to see him. And finally, we see that the words of the disciples, or the, I'm sorry, the word of the angels were the words that changes history. Up until this point, the sadness of the women and the sadness of all the followers of Jesus was seen until those words were spoken that changed history forever. He is not here. He is risen. The dividing line between the past and the future, between what happened for those disciples and what happens to us. I mean, you even look at the way that uh, the history of the world is divided and we see the truth in the way that we have before Christ, B.C., and, after, and then Anno Domine, A.D., which stands for in the year of our Lord. Now, of course, our secular world wants to eliminate God from even the history books, but we still have the before and after Christ. Our, our date, which the whole world uses, they can't get away from why do we have the dates that we have. 2019, since the resurrection of Christ, since the coming of Jesus, that is. So it doesn't matter if they want to call it before Common Era, BCE, or after Common Era. It doesn't matter if they want to change it. Christ's death and resurrection, his life is the 
turning point of history. It is the dividing point of history, and it is the dividing point of our lives. Whether you came to faith as a child or maybe as an adult, there is the point at which Christ changed everything for you. And if you don't have that, if you don't have the kind of faith that sees that before you were lost in sin, before you were hurting and guilty, that you didn't know where your life was going, and then afterwards you see everything is different, then that is what Christ is here for you today, to give you hope, to give you strength, to remind you that your life is different. Because, because of faith in Jesus, we have life. Eternal life begins not just in heaven, it begins now. It begins when we trust in Jesus to carry us through this life, when we see that he forgives us and he can give us healing for the pain in our hearts. The fact that everything is different because of the resurrection is reflected over and over again in scripture. i just give you a few examples. Think about how Paul, whose name was Saul, who wrote many of the epistles in the New Testament, he was a, a persecutor of Christians before he became a believer in Jesus, because Jesus appeared to him. He saw the resurrected Christ. And his, before his life, he was hating Christians, and afterwards, he saw them as, as his brothers and sisters. And he writes in Romans 3, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he sees himself as a lost sinner, that he was not perfect, and that he would be condemned to hell. But he writes in the next sentence, but being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. His future is completely changed, 180 degrees. That's what it is for you and for me. We are forgiven because Jesus died, but we're also free because he is alive. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, we're still lost in our sins. But Paul reminds us that that changed everything. And even in John 11, before Jesus was even resurrected, he's talking to Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. And Lazarus had died and was in the tomb for four days. Now, his resurrection wasn't the final resurrection because he had to face death again. Jesus was the first person to rise from the dead who would never die again. We're talking about the final resurrection. That's why the Bible calls his the first fruits. For all who come after him will be raised eternally. But Jesus says to them, you know, do you believe your brother will rise again? And Martha says, oh, yes, I believe in the last day he'll rise. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though they die, yet they shall live. I mean, Jesus hadn't even risen from the dead yet. He's already telling them, I'm the resurrection. I'm what life is all about. I'm the one who came to conquer death. And you will see it with your own eyes right now as he raised Lazarus from the dead. But now all of us see it in the witness of Scripture because it is the words that these people wrote in the Bible. It's not just made up. There's no way it could be made up because we see that they didn't even themselves believe it at first. I mean, it was just as hard for them to believe that someone could be raised from the dead as it is today. I mean, maybe more so then because people uh, died at a younger age and they died from a lot more ailments than people do today. So they, were, uh, they knew death in a very intimate way. So to see Jesus in the tomb, they knew he was stone cold dead. Making up this idea that he was raised if it didn't actually happen is crazy. It's even harder to believe maybe than even the resurrection. But Jesus' resurrection shows that sin died with him. It shows us that we are then alive in faith because of him. And the resurrection isn't complete until we see that the response has been made. How sad would it have been if the women would have gone from the tomb and said nothing? Kind of like Peter when he goes into the tomb. He sees it himself and then he walked away wondering, scratching his head. Oh, I don't know what to believe. At least the women responded. At least they told somebody. And the other gospels tell us that eventually the other disciples, they got on the bandwagon because the resurrection isn't complete until our response is that we proclaim that he is risen from the dead. To offer the good news is all we have to do. We don't need to convince people. We don't need to argue them into faith. We can simply say that God can do for you what he has done for me. God does that. He's the one who creates faith. He's the one who changes lives. I'd like to close with a little story about a, 
uh, about a missionary named Earl Stanley Jones. He was in Africa many years, and in his autobiography, he writes about one of the young men in Africa that he met. He preached about Jesus. He told him the story, how he had lived and he died, but then he was raised from the dead. This young man was changed forever because of this message. And because of that, he changed his name. This young man changed his name to After because his life was never the same. Having learned that Jesus loved him that much, having heard the good news that Jesus was alive, he told everybody, my name is Mr. After. What? What does that mean? Maybe all of us should change our names to something that reflects the truth of whose we are in Jesus Christ. Some people maybe do have names like that, like hope or faith. But what if we told people our name, I've changed my name to resurrection, or I changed my name to hallelujah, because that is what our lives are like because of Jesus. Maybe what makes us different is that we are after Christians. We are those who live after the resurrection. We proclaim that truth in the way we live. And when we fail, when we don't live up to what it means to be a believer, God is stronger. Jesus Christ conquered the grave. He will conquer your sins as well. And we can truly live as after Christians. Amen.